So you, you talked about Steve, you know, Steve's plan was to win every race against everybody, you know, going into that race yeah. against the Australians. I, I just wonder what you learned from Steve because, you know, you've got a pretty uh, amazing personality and, uh, you know, hugely, hugely competitive. What, what was a guy like you going to learn from Steve? Well, don't forget when I started rowing with him, I was 19. Wow, so, that, yeah. yeah. Um, and it really annoyed him that one of the newspapers wrote this article about how Steve Redgrave was rowing in a pair with a teenager for the next Olympics. Um, <laughs> I turned 20 very quickly and he said, they didn't print that. They didn't print that. Um, I think, I think what he, so how to describe it? It, it, it's now very difficult to unpick what my character was before because you're still maturing hugely between yeah. 19 and 25, 26, you know, that the, the brain is changing. I mean, I know that sort of medically is true, but also that sort of racing mindset, the sporting mindset is still forming and it definitely was for me. Um, and I was slightly caught because I don't think I was um, outrageously confident or cocky uh going into that partnership but i soon realized actually do you know if i if i sort of retreat into my shell um then it's not gonna it's not gonna get the best out of me it's certainly not going to get the best out of steve what he needs is someone who's yeah. you know in his court and saying look, let's do this, let's do that. And and then, you know, Jürgen moved me to the stroke seat as well. So then it was even more of a sense of, right, you know, am I going to, am I going to row sort of hunched over with this looming presence and, and voice behind me? Or am I going to, you know, sit up tall and just get yeah. figuratively and mentally take this, take this by the horns. And, and so, um, he and, and Steve gave me all sorts of, I suppose, permissions is not the right word, but 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 the, you know, he gave me that latitude to 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 do that role, um, and I think I think we fed off each other really well because he had a huge amount to teach me. He'd been to two Olympics, he'd won them both. Um, yes, he was looking for a partner. Yes, he needed a partner, but at the same time, he was trusting me that I could do that that job um and particularly when it came to sort of 92 and that first olympics um it was it was about dealing with the olympic village and the olympic experience which can just be overpowering if you're not ready for it or it catches you by surprise it can just be completely bewildering for a, a little sport like rowing where a world championships is um uh is uh yeah there we go for a little sport like rowing you, you can just get totally snowballed by everybody in the world suddenly being in in one place at one time you you were pretty confident in that race i, I don't know if that's one of the best rows you ever had or you were that much better than the opposition but you you know you're coming up to 500 there you've got a good lead yeah we were uh, Steve was really ill in the run-up to uh, to Barcelona. Um, we lost our last race. In those days, there was nothing like a World Cup circuit. You used to go to uh, what were called international regattas, um, and you you sort of looked down the entry list the night before in the hotel, uh, sort of right. Well, who's here? And maybe it was club guys maybe it was under 23 guys maybe it was the olympic champion you know it was just sort of and then they you remember what it was like you would you would go down you do your warm up and all that the whole pairs field yeah. would do would do the warm up and then they, they they would announce from the from the tannoys on the start tower yeah you know roll call for like 35 crews who's here you know pinsent red girl yeah we're here you know Who's here? So Slovenia, yes, we're here. You know, so and so Ruder Club, yes, we're here. And so, and then they'd, and then they'd, we all go quiet for four or five minutes, and then they'd put together heats. And so there yeah. was no, it was just a, 
and 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 we lost our last our last race, which was uh, Essen, uh, before going to Barcelona. And when we got back from there, Steve was really sick. I mean, he he thought it was food poisoning, but it, it was the beginning of his colitis, which is a sort of life term, lifelong condition, um, and all to do with sort of inflammation of the of the intestine. He wasn't getting the nutrition. He wasn't uh, absorbing it right. It was horrendous, but. Um, once he got on the right meds and got the right specialist to come and talk to him, we we had a great last training camp and then came into uh, to Barcelona sort of on a high and we drew the Slovenian pair, uh, Chop and... Um, Langley? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Doc Chop. Um, and uh, we drew them in the heat and they had been the ones to... Uh, to beat us in Essen 10, eight, 10 weeks before. And we just rode away from them comfortably. And at the end of that race, the hairs on my neck were standing up. because I was thinking, wow. if we've just beaten them, who else is there in this field? Uh, and in fact, there were lots of good pairs in that field. I mean, um, uh, Jean-Christophe Roland and Michel Andre were in that, in that field. But we knew that the Slovenians were really one of the one of the medal contenders as we thought we were at that point and then we won the heat so comfortably that it was like okay this could be on um and then it and then it became a matter of producing what we were capable of in the final which i suppose in a nutshell is is what sport and rowing and the olympics is all about is is doing what you're capable of when the when your body is telling you that that's quite difficult it's quite a commanding margin you've got to finish there. It must have been a great row. It was about a minute in. Do you, uh, do you think that's 400 gone? It could no, be. No, that, that's 1950. So has that gone on? I, I, I've, I've been winding it on. Have you seen um, – I've got a finish slide now. Can you see that? Hasn't changed. Take it down and put it back up again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give me another option. Yeah, I'll give you I another mean, option. Within about a minute, I think that first photo you showed me was 400 meters in, don't you think? Yeah. I, um, we were nearly a length up. Uh, Is that the finished picture? Have you well, got... I know the winning margin. The winning margin was 4.99 seconds. It was 100 yeah. short of five seconds. There you go. Okay, yeah. now I'm seeing. Now the the... The one with the boat in the background, uh, if everyone's seeing that at the same time and you're seeing that, that that boat was, was as you say, 50 metres from the finish line. And that angle is, is sort of narrowing the gap. I think we had two lengths of clear water by this stage. And, and, and I, remember, I remember way back in the first thousand, first 600 metres, thinking, we're going to win this. Uh, and and it was the most amazing sensation of rowing along, really nice rowing, completely relaxed. And I was looking back on, you know, your opposition yeah. is behind you. And what I also realized looking at them for 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a minute, is that they weren't turning. There was no faces coming back to us. No one was looking. And then trying something and seeing uh, if that had made a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had completely discounted us. Uh, and I thought, right, all we've got to do is stay out of their consciousness, stay out of their eye line. Um, but Steve had other ideas, which is just, you know, more, 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 keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, yeah, it was a lovely, lovely feeling. So taking you, taking you for four years four years later it was quite a different feeling quite a different sort of tension in atlanta um yeah it was i think i think part of that was being out and out favorites um and we had we had bought that on ourselves because we said in the press conference after the barcelona race we want to go to atlanta and win that gold there and that four years of people coming and saying, oh, you said a year ago, you said two years ago, you said three years ago, you said four years ago, you were going to win. Are you, are you, are you, are you? And it's just like, oh. And at that stage, it doesn't seem like such a big story now, but it was an enormous story that a Brit was going to win four Olympic gold medals back to back. 
Um, and so the suddenly at the rowing lake for the heat and for the semi-final, we had all the British media there and not just the rowing correspondents, but, but sort of sports journalists who we'd never met before. And they said, oh, I'm from the Sun, I'm from the Mirror, I'm from the uh you know daily star or something and you're like you're doing rowing like and it was like you know our press conferences even after the heat were sort of 50 60 people um yeah. just it was it was and 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 there's no escaping it and then we had there were two other factors in the run up to that race one of which we had illness in the village in the Olympic Village in Atlanta, in the British blocks, we had illness. And and indeed, in the room next door, that was James, who got a sort of stomach bug. And um, Anne Redgrave, Steve's wife, uh, her immediate decision was, right, we've got our spare men who weren't allowed in the Olympic Village, men and women. The spares are up in a, um, a sort of holiday inn or something up at Lanier. Uh, an hour away, we should move them out somewhere else and we should move the men's pair and the men's four into those rooms for the last four or five days running up to the the uh, the finals. And so we moved out of the village and that became very strange. And and then the the the, the last thing was the Centennial Park bomb went off the night before our yeah. our race um yeah. like i think it was like one in the morning or two in the morning it went off and then um our race was first of the saturday finals uh so we were something like 9 25 or 9 30 in the morning we were the first gold medal decided after the bomb um and it was it completely cast a shadow and a pall over the olympics for days but also the venue and flags were at half mast and volunteers were in tears um, when we when we showed up and 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 Steve was just like look blinkers on if the race is nine twenty five or nine thirty that's when our race is it we just got to get the job done ignore it all do the race um, but we didn't row nearly as well. Um, and it became it became a battle um, with the French, with JC, um, in the in the sort of closing stages, and the Australians. Um, and I'm just glad. Well, I'm glad we won. I think the winning margin was about a second and a half. Not much um, of a winning margin, is it? Really? There you go. There you go. Yeah. So it's about half a length. And I, I think it's the Aussies in second. I think that's green and gold second. And then uh, JC and Michelle are, uh, a third, Michael a third. Um, it's yeah, it it it. And Steve was absolutely knacked by it. It was he was just so relieved to have it done. I don't think he found uh, that um, Olympics uh, an enjoyable experience at all. What? What was your reaction to hearing Steve say, "If anyone sees me near a boat again, did you did you say anything to him about that, or just take it in and think, oh, he's just saying that now?" Well, if you watch the, it's very difficult to find now, but I remember watching it back uh, a few weeks afterwards. He starts with saying, "If anyone sees me anywhere near a boat again," and I put in the words, "Shoot him." I interrupt his sentence it's quite quietly because the camera's not pointing at me. Yeah. I just said, shoot him. And he says, you've got permission to me. Um, and it became a sort of classic thing. And it was no surprise to me because you, we, or he particularly, went round the circuit that last year, sort of always saying, right, well, this is the last time I'm going to be here and this is the last time I'm going to be in Silvretta in the mountain training camp and this is the last ergo test I'm ever going to do got to make it a good one and so it was sort of you know you're saying goodbye last time in Lucerne last time uh can't remember if we did Henley in 96 no it probably wasn't so 95 might have been the last one for us um but it it, it was so it was no surprise to me it was more emphatic than it was more definite and I, I was I was surprised that I suppose he did it to well it yeah a live TV camera then it was done um, 
And then he and Anne and the children, uh, who were all quite young at that stage, they must have been, yeah, I mean, Natalie can only have been five or six. His eldest daughter of three can only have been five or six then. They all went down to Disney in Florida for a couple of weeks. And uh, and then the next time I saw them, it was back in the UK. Um, and, and that second week of the Olympics, I had a great time. Uh, but I was all I was already beginning to think, right, you know, life after Steve, should I row a pair? Who's around? You know, um, maybe maybe Greg and I would work, um, but we'd have to change sides. One of us would have to change sides. Maybe there's a four. Am I am I going to take a year out? All those sorts of things were um, were going around my head. So that, then you had this, uh, you know, the, the, the four with James and, and Tim, and you had this amazing sort of fly-on-the-wall documentary, Gold Fever. And we were talking about the similarities between Gold Fever and uh, the documentary about the Chicago Bulls last dance. I, mean, <laughs> I'm, I I'm hope not. not. I I'm hope not. not. Sure, I'm not sure Gold Fever could happen in the squad now, as it happened then. It's been viewed loads and loads of times on YouTube. It's a great watch. I I can I can only watch little clips of it. I I yeah. Maybe I'll sit down and watch it all back at some point. It was um it was very difficult to make because it was a very early version of um us which which now seems seems sort of every day. It was a very early version of vlogging really because the beeb gave us little cameras and and they would say, right, here's a box of tapes. We used to get them in boxes of 10. When the box is full, fill up the tapes and send them back to us. And then they would go through and log them. And then we had four cameras, uh, you know, all filming. And then we, you would go through, you know, days or weeks where you wouldn't do anything. You'd slightly lose the motivation. And then you'd get into it again and you'd start recording things. And they made it very easy to record stuff in the car um and we we would say right well we won't do every race but we'll do this race weekend or we'll do this training camp or whatever um and then they would feed back and say oh this worked really well when you did this and we really love it when when you're having a conversation and steve and i hit on this thing where you'd be sharing a room and you'd have a conversation but you'd have two cameras running at once and sometimes we'd be on the beds talking about what was going on or I'd be in the bathroom or, you know, doing something fairly mundane and recording and then he'd be talking from the other room and and it just, it, it became, it became, and the closer it got, of course, the more valuable it became uh, because it became a bigger and bigger story. And then, and then the Beeb did brilliantly to edit, edit it all together and then it went out um, for four or five nights in succession, I think. Yeah. Uh, we didn't see it go out, but, um, but it was running up to the opening ceremony or something like that. It was absolutely sort of box office watching. For a sports documentary, um, it was just the first and, and amazing. And it was amazing publicity for us. It was um, it was an amazing build-up to that to that sydney race ian weirs just said it would be great if you steve tim and james could do a goggle box of you watching gold fever together <laughs> it's yeah it would be good actually it would be good there were, there were there are some things that just that just stand out um just the sort of um, and, 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 and there are, there's a number of reasons why I don't think it would, it would work now because, because, um, we used to have training camps in quite small groups. So Jürgen used to, used to take his, I mean, it was sort of closing down in the run up to Sydney and that we had a bigger squad and obviously the eight, uh, and the pair, all the men's sweet team, um, sort of moved, uh, on mass, but, but then, but then, you know, that unit of the four was very close. And so you could get a lot of us feeding off one another and getting to know the way that we, and there's no hiding really, you know, for four years of filming, you're not going to come across as something that you aren't. 
and so you're going to get it all you're going to get it absolutely all and all steve's illness issues and james with his love life and um yeah just tim with the party. Of... say again tim with the party oh still not quite forgiving him for that no. <laughs> kieran, I clark, just... kieran clark's got a question um Matt, he said that yeah. um, your winning margins were reduced at each Olympics. Do you feel the speed of the British men's sweep at the time forced other nations to step up? Um, yes, possibly. Um, but, yeah, I don't... I don't necessarily think that we, well, I mean, I know why the margin in Athens was so small. I mean, I think that was a, we were, that that team, that Olympic team was scrambling um, because we had an illness and an injury in the top boat um, right at the at the death of the Olympia, you know, with, with Alex Partridge coming out of the boat. Uh, that then sent a sort of shockwave through the team that I think affected our, our results in almost every boat class. Um, Yes, it's. I, I suppose that's an interesting theory that that we laid the gauntlet down to other people. Um, I suppose that's true. But then we've stayed ahead since. Um, you know, we've we've carried on winning um, 2008, 2012, 2016, and in fact, probably the 2016 men's team was, or the, even the the 2012 and 2016 teams were were stronger, much stronger than we were in the 90s. And then you add in the women, and it was just, just a sort of, you know, unbeatable combination. 